started. Well, good evening and welcome to the Minneapolis College of Art and Design. My name is Carrie Morgan and I'm the gallery director here at MCAD. And I also have the honor of being the program administrator for the Jerome Foundation Fellowships for Emerging Artists. And tonight's information session will be about an hour to an hour and a half long in length. And um, I'm joined here this evening by Nikki McComb, who is one of our 2016-17 Jerome Fellows. And her work will be on view in our final culminating exhibition for last year's Fellows. And that show will open in our main gallery on September 29th, and it'll be on view until the 7th of November. So I hope you get the chance to come back and see the show. And um, this evening, and just to give you a, a preface too, that the first part will be a description of the, of the process of applying for a Jerome Fellowship. And the second part is more the technical side. So if, at, if you don't want and don't need the information about how to change the size of an image or how to upload, those kind of things if you feel very comfortable with, you're, well, feel free to, to leave whenever you have the information you need. And also, although I have kind of a pre-planned script, at the same time, if you have questions, if you raise your hand, um, I'm happy to answer your question. And I might say I'll get to that in a minute. But again, this is an opportunity for you to get the information you want. And um, so do feel free to stop me at any time. I am going to lower the lights a little so you can see the screen better. And also just want to give you a heads up that we, we are videotaping this particular session because a lot of people in greater Minnesota may not be able to come to our info sessions. And we want to make sure that people who can't attend still have access to the information and most importantly to the questions that you might have because you may be thinking the things that other people are also thinking. So let me try and dim the lights and we'll get started. All right. Well, first I'll say a little bit about the Jerome Foundation. Um, we're very lucky, as probably all of you know, that we have a lot of foundational support in our state for the arts. It's pretty unprecedented if you look at any other city in the, or state in the country. The Jerome Foundation's been around for quite a while. It was created by artist and philanthropist Jerome Hill, and he was the great-grandson of the robber baron. <laughs> James J. Hill, whose mansion is on Summit Avenue in St. Paul. But Jerome Hill um, was an experimental filmmaker as well as a painter and a composer, so he was multi-talented in the arts. And he wanted to set up a foundation that supported the arts, both in the state of Minnesota, which is his home state, but he also lived in New York City. So if you ever travel to New York and you go to uh, an art gallery or maybe a theater performance and you see the Jerome Foundation logo somewhere promoting it, it's because the Jerome Foundation is also actively supporting the emerging arts in the five boroughs of New York City. So we are in good company that uh, they fund that hot spot for the arts as well as our whole state. But what they do at the Jerome Foundation is um, they want to support the development and production of new works by emerging artists. And they want to diversify creativity. They want to lead to rich experiences for audiences. And central to the foundation's review of um, proposals uh, for fellowships is that we have to be able to assess the quality of artistic work. So the values that the Jerome Foundation has is for diversity, for innovation and risk, and for humility. So it's my job as the program director to apply to the Jerome Foundation every other year to support this fellowship. And it is a fellowship that's been around since 1981. It's a very long standing foundational support that we've had, but it's not a given that in the next year we will continue with it. So I will encourage you right now <laughs> to apply for this Jerome Fellowship because I say um, you never know their funding um, pool differs from year to year, and um, they're going to be unveiling a different kind of artist support system that you as artists can apply for as well in 2018. So there's no guarantee that this particular fellowship will occur in the future. So now may be your last chance, <laughs> so please apply. 
So what do we provide as far as a framework for supporting emerging artists through this particular fellowship? So um, as the slide tells you, um, the goal of this fellowship program is to significantly advance artistically and critically emerging visual artists in Minnesota. And over the summer in June, the Jerome Foundation adopted new language and guidelines surrounding the definition of an early career and emerging artist. The new emphasis is on funding artists at a relatively early and still formative stage of their career in hopes of providing them footing within their respective fields. The focus is on career achievement and recognition. This program determines emerging status based on the totality of an artistic career, not on achievement within a single discipline. Age is not a factor in determining an emerging artist, and the Jerome Foundation welcomes applications from artists representing diverse cultural perspectives. So in order to um, determine like what is an emerging artist or an early career artist, one of the things you have to provide us with um, as part of your application materials is a, is a resume. And um, this resume will probably represent you know, limited but, but promising exhibition experience or other types of artistic experiences that you've had as a professional um, artist. And I'll get to a moment um, some more clear definitions of the eligibility requirements. But um, just to say that we have, of course, are adopting whatever language of the Jerome Foundation claims as its definition of an early career emerging artist. That's what we also need to make sure we're in line with. So we'll discuss that. So what does this particular fellowship offer? Um, what we do is um, I select three different independent uh, arts professionals to jury all of the applications that come in. We select one juror from the state of Minnesota. So it's somebody who's kind of conversant or knows something about the art scene. And then we select two people who are outside of our state. Um, they might be curators, they might be art historians, they might be arts writers, or they are usually one of them is gonna be an artist, him or herself. So those are, that's our, our pool. We use three so that it's easy, to, not easy, but it's, um, it's not a huge jury, but it's also not just one person. It's usually about a conversation. It's about a consensus building exercise, and it's always different. And I want to stress that because you might look back in the 36 year history of, of this fellowship and you'll see just a wide variety of types of artists who are selected. Um, they work in a lot of different media. Um, you know, we hope to always encourage diversity in all its its forms, and um, the jury pool, the jury, jury always changes. So if you don't get it one year, you can't say this, oh, I'm never gonna get one because you just have to keep applying, so long as we have our fellowship. So, um, so what do you win as a part of this fellowship? So we have a pool of usually about 230 to 250 applicants, and out of that application pool, five will receive a Jerome Fellowship. And the monetary award is a $12,000 that you can use however you wish. It should be used, hopefully, to help make new work because it is a given that you will have a culminating show in our main gallery space about 10 months after you receive the fellowship. So that needs to be in your mindset. Um, but at the same time, the money is yours. It's a gift of time and hopefully a gift of, of possibilities. And um, in addition to that money, you have the opportunity to meet with three different critics. Um, one will be a local writer or someone from the state of Minnesota who will meet with you, do a studio visit with you, and write an essay about your work. You also have the chance to choose an, an individual whom you might have um, wanted to meet. It might be someone from the Walker Art Center, or maybe it's an independent curator, or maybe it's um, an artist that you've wanted to have as a mentor. You get to choose one person, again, has to be uh, local or in-state, um, who would meet with you on a one-to-one -one basis. Um, and then finally, when your show is up with your other fellows, um, you have the opportunity to invite a national critic or curator or art historian, whomever, as a group, you decide to invite one person to come and see your culminating show. And they spend uh, two days in the Twin Cities and they see your show and they do individual studio visits with you. And hopefully to, to kind of give you some feedback about what's on view, but then also, and importantly, to talk about like what's next, because you've come off of hopefully a, a good year, a productive year, and um, 
perhaps you have ideas, you're looking for a little guidance. And so we're trying to give you opportunities um, to interact with different types of artists, other types of curators, and just expand your network a little bit and to help kind of give you some confidence and to help build your support network too. So that's kind of what we do um, as part of our fellowship year. And as I say, we're coming up to the, the culminating exhibition. And also when your show is on view, we have a discussion panel. And so I hope you can, you can mark this down now that our upcoming discussion panel with our 2016-17 fellows is gonna be on a Tuesday, October 10th. And um, the, the writer from Rochester who has written the essays will come up and she will moderate um, that discussion. So I hope you will attend that as well. So our eligibility requirements. So again, I'm kind of reading from what the Jerome Foundation um, is, is giving us as far as, as, as I apply to them to continue funding this fellowship. Uh, these are the things that I have to make sure this fellowship is doing. So um, they wanna support artists who have an ongoing commitment to working in the arts, rather than engaging in art as a hobby, as a pastime or an occasional pursuit. And they also wanna support artists who have already completed their training if they have decided to pursue formal training at all. I mean, you don't need a BFA or an MFA to get a, a fellowship at all. We, I've had numerous fellows who have had little or no tr artistic training. They are self-taught and that's perfectly fine. But if you are right now, like pursuing an MFA or a BFA, a, a particular art degree with, you cannot apply for a Jerome fellowship. You have to be out of that mentorship kind of moment. So um, that's something to keep in mind to make sure you're eligible. The second point is you have to be artists who at this time of application have generated, completed, and publicly presented, exhibited, or published work in the discipline in which the support is requested. Um, artists, your primary goal needs to be generating new works as opposed to remounting or reinterpreting existing works. And again, this is a description kind of writ large. So this is for someone who might be in the theater arts or who might be um, in the, uh, a writer or something. So some of these may not feel quite as applicable to the visual arts, but again, I just wanna, I wanna kind of give you the purview of, of the Jerome Foundation. Um, you need to be an artist who's expanding the genre, form, or social boundaries or audience for the discipline in which they work. Artists who are in the early stages of their creative development. Artists who have a focused direction and goals, even while still developing your artistic voice. Artists who have yet to be substantially celebrated within their field, the media, funding circles, or the public at large. Artists who are legal residents of the state of Minnesota and have been residents for at least a year prior to the submission of an application. And that's determined by voting or payment of taxes in the state. An applicant must also have a street mailing address within Minnesota to be eligible to apply. So, Take, for example, you might have been born here and raised here, but you have went to um, Kansas, to the Kansas City Art Institute to pursue an art degree. If you graduated just in June, you cannot move back to Minnesota and apply for this fellowship. You have to live here in the state for a full year before you apply again. And so if the deadline, which it is on September 15th, you need to have lived in the state since September 15th of last year. So sometimes we have a lot of questions about that. More eligibility requirements. We're trying to cover the field here. So, artist's work must fall within current visual art practice. Artists may work in a variety of visual art media, both traditional and new media. Um, the fellowship that we are um, hosting is not intended for commercial artists, musicians, theater artists, or others whose work is generally not presented in a visual art context. Artists must reside in the state until the end of the 12 month fellowship period. Artists must be able to provide evidence that they are an early career artist. Your resume will demonstrate limited but promising exhibition exposure and no more than a few grants or fellowships in direct support of your work. Artists living outside of the Twin Cities metropolitan area who receive a fellowship must be willing to travel to the Twin Cities for fellowship events, meetings with visiting critics, and other group meetings, but mileage and lodging for trips will be reimbursed. I just want to mention that we would love to have more artists from greater Minnesota apply for this fellowship and also 
win this fellowship. And we don't want it to be an economic hardship for even if you're a finalist, for example, and you live in Park Rapids, and you need to bring your artwork down here to have the three jurors see it, we'll pay for you to rent a U-Haul if need be, or to bring your work down and compensate you for your mileage back and forth, and a hotel even. Again, I, we don't want money to be a barrier to being able to apply. So artists must be willing to meet with visiting critics during the fellowship period and accommodate their schedules to the critics' visits. This may include arranging for and transporting your artwork to a location in the Twin Cities for studio visits. And one of the good things of hosting this kind of fellowship here is that we, we have a lot of wall space and we have classrooms. And so even if you uh, live here in the Twin Cities and you have a studio visit with somebody but you don't feel like your home space or you don't um, rent a space for a studio, you can just call me up and say, Carrie, I need, I need a space to show so-and-so my work. Can you arrange that? And so we will make that happen for you. Artists must be willing to participate in a fellowship exhibition and related activities. Um, artists are eligible to receive this fellowship once every three years. However, if you are a prior recipient, that fact will be taken into consideration. It is kind of interesting that we've actually, in the history of this fellowship, have never given it to somebody twice. Um, but I think that's probably because we have other ways of supporting artists, and they're often going to the Minnesota State Arts Board for grant support, or you go to the McKnight Foundation once you are more of a mid-career artist. Um, also, artists who live, you know, there's all kinds of arts councils in the state, and they too have McKnight money um, and Minnesota State Arts Board money that helps support artists in, in different um, regions of our state. So. Also, I need to note that artists who have received um, a McKnight Visual Artist Fellowship or McKnight Photography Fellowship, these are both for mid-career artists. Um, you're not eligible to apply for this particular Jerome Emerging Artist Fellowship. But if you have won this fellowship, you can apply for other Jerome fellowships. So just because you've won one doesn't mean you can't, like the Minnesota State, excuse me, the, um, the High Point Center for Printmaking has a Jerome fellowship. There's a Minnesota um, Book Art Center that has Jerome fellowships and mentorships. The Textile Center has a Jerome fellowship. So if you you're welcome to apply for other Jerome fellowships. Um, but once you've won a McKnight mid-career fellowship, you can't go back to being an emerging or early career artist. I think that probably makes sense. So are there any questions yet about the re eligibility requirements that I just went through? Yes. So So the question is that because you're, if I do believe you have to be a U.S. citizen. Yeah, vote or pay taxes. You know, I, you pay taxes. I, I, you know, it's not on the Jerome website, I don't think, explicitly. So I'd have to go and ask about that. So that's a good question. So I'll go, I'll find out about it. I think you have to be a U.S. citizen. Um, but I am not 100% sure. I mean, you have to, when you win a fellowship, you have to pay taxes on that, and so you have to have a social security number. You have a social security number, so I'll have to get definitive information about that. So, yeah, another question. Yeah. So the question is like, what does exhibited or displayed mean? It means. Um, and there's, there's not just like your resume, that's one of the, we don't put examples of, of resumes out necessarily because people almost might feel like, oh my gosh, my resume doesn't look like this person's resume and maybe I shouldn't apply. And everybody's resume is going to look different. But the idea of having had some ex exhibition experience is that it's kind of proof that you're a professional artist, that you're trying to get your work noticed, um, that you are um, you know, ambitious about getting your work seen. And so it might be a coffee shops, it might be um, your local library, you know, it might be the Minneapolis Institute of Art, you know, that's fine. But if it's, since this is the emerging, um, the idea is that if you have had a lot of solo shows somewhere, maybe you're not emerging yet. Um, but as I say, displays are, are just really opportunities. Like maybe you apply for a lot of juried shows in the region and get in. So it's kind of just proof that this is, this is something that you are dedicated to and that you have some experience with. It's Because again, the fellowship is pretty intense. I mean, you're given quite a bit of money. And the idea is that you have to have a body of work to prove that, you know, you're, um, you know, and you're, 
you know, very dedicated to what you're doing and um, and that others have also seen the talent in you too. I think that's one of the things when you apply for something, it's having this outside validation. And that's a lot of what, since art is so subjective, it's having other people say, wow, there's a lot of value in what you're doing. I would really like to be able to promote your work or those kinds of activities. Does that help explain your question? Okay. Are you, any other questions about the eligibility requirements? No, okay, great. So the application process. Um, the deadline is Friday, September 15th at noon. It's been noon for many years, and it's going to be noon for many years. So um, don't call me at 12.05 and say that um, it was my com that it was taking too long for your images to upload, because that's not a reason for me to reopen this application for just you. Um, I actually don't have the possibility of reopening an application in terms that we have, it's an automated system. And once it shuts down, it shuts down. So I encourage everybody to start at least a week in advance. And if you have questions, concerns, I mean, you can start, you can call me tomorrow and start asking me questions about, I don't understand this, you know, I'm not figuring this out. You know, just do it early. Just don't do it the day that it's due because I can't help you, because I'm going to have 10 other people who are calling having last minute crises. So it's incumbent that you, you start early. And if you submit early, you can call me up and say, Carrie, I've just submitted this. Would you please review my application and make sure everything looks in order? Because quite honestly, sometimes people upload some images that might be a little blurry, or maybe there's something you accidentally uploaded to artist statements instead of your artist and your resume. And um, the fellowship coordinator, Melanie Pankow, and I will be going through every single application because we have to look at your resume. We have to make sure you uploaded an artist statement and not your laundry list. And um, so we will do that, but we don't have the time to tell you, you know, what image number five was a little blurry. So, I mean, if you want us to give you some real, you know, we're not going to evaluate you. We're not jurors, but we could say, you know what, this looks, something's wrong here. Um, and then we can give you the red flag. If we're doing this on September 16th, we're not going to, I can't tell you your images are blurry. I will tell you if you accidentally upload your grocery list instead of your artist statement, though. We do want to make sure that the, the jurors are seeing, you know, the right parts. So if you do that, then what, what happens is that I send you an email or call you, and then I say, gosh, you made a mistake or something's wrong, and then you can send something to me, and then I can upload it from my end. But at, after... September 15th at noon, you are not going to have access to your application. Okay, uh, we do apply online. And if you have problems with computers and things like that, again, you can come and we can help you work with this. There's also help at Springboard for the Arts. They have computers there that you can use. Um, again, we don't want computer technology to be a reason not to apply. And we have resources if, if you need help. Um, so what do you have to do to apply? We try to make it simple, not too onerous. So what you need to provide are 10 images, and they are low res in the sense that they, they shouldn't be blurry, but they can be web, because you know, they're only going to be viewed on screen. We're not going to print these images out. Um, and they do need to be formatted correctly at 1920 pixels in either in the longest dimension. So that might be 1920 horizontal or 1920 vertical. It doesn't have to be square, though. You don't have to add a white or black border to make it a perfectly square image. If you are an artist who uses video in your work, or if you do time-based work, if you do sound installation, you know, obviously a static image is not going to convey that. And so you are allowed to include a video if you use multimedia sound installation in your work. Um, you can upload up to two videos, three minutes each max. And we try to just limit it because, again, our jurors are looking at quite a few images. And um, even if you have a great 10-minute video, you just have to choose to show me a three-minute snippet. Um, you can loop things. Like, what if all of your work is somehow multimedia? And um, I've had artists do that, where all 10 images, like for one of the uploaded it, there's five little clips on one YouTube video, and there's five little clips on another. That's perfectly fine, but we do ask that you keep it within that three-minute max. 
And also I'll just mention that the video is not intended to show you walking around your paintings or your sculptures or through an installation unless it's really about being a time-based piece. And we have an, I know that that's hard often for different media sometimes. Um, so I'll, I'll get to something in a minute that might help you. Um, but in addition to the 10 images, the video, you are required um, to have a resume. And we do provide a link to the College Art Association. They have a good description of kind of how you might categorize your um, resume. Again, you don't have to follow it to a T, but it's a, it's a good representation of, of um, and again, you don't have to have a lot under each category, but it gives you a sense of kind of the standard for artists' resumes. So. Uh, an art, yes, a question, uh-huh. How about uh, curriculum details? That would work too? Yeah, that's fine. It can be a CV. It can be much, usually a resume is a little bit tighter and doesn't go into a lot of explanation, um, but you can use a CV as well. That's fine. Mm -hmm. So an artist statement, um, we ask it to be no longer than one page single spaced. And again, the issue with that is you know, brevity is probably best, <laughs> well, again, with jurors. Um, um, reviewing statements, they have access to your resume and they have access to your artist statement. Um, but actually, in the first round of jurying, they're not required to look at either. So I'll, I'll go back to a minute to say that your 10 images matter a lot. And I'll, we'll talk about this in a little bit more depth too. Um, it's only in the second round of jurying, if you become a semifinalist, um, that I can actually check to see if they've read your resume or check to see if, you, if they've reviewed your artist statement. And that's because in the second round of juring, they review all the images again. And then we have a two hour to three hour conference call where we go through all 30 to 40 semifinalists. And I can say, well, what did you think about the resume? What did you think about the artist statement? And if there's any questions, then it comes up. But I, part of the issue, again, is so many applications. And we give them two weeks to go through the 250, but it's, it's a lot to read. But no matter what, artist statements, as I say, if you really shouldn't need more than a page to say what you need to say. That artist statement does need, however, we ask for you to address, you know, what are you going to be working on in the upcoming year? And we ask, it's not like, this isn't a project grant. It's not like you have to say how much you're doing and um, how much you're going to spend and why you need $12,000, you know, itemized. But we, the jurors are going to make up in their brain, <laughs> they're going to come up with ideas about maybe what you're going to be working on. But this is your chance to actually say. Because what if, for example, in your images, you have two different bodies of work that are both, you're kind of both working on right now? which is great, but maybe you need to explain that a little bit. Or maybe you want to say that um, your images, you're going to want to go in a different direction. You know, that's your opportunity to kind of, again, give them a sense of maybe the ambition of your work, um, what you would like to see yourself doing. Because they're thinking, I'm going to give you this money. I'm also giving you the chance to talk to these outside critics. And like, what if they come and visit you and you're like, you know, I'm not sure what I want to do yet. You know, I've finished this great body of work and I got a lot of, I'm feeling good about it, but i just not sure what's next. Those jurors don't want to hear that. Um, so that's this is your artist statement is a chance to kind of outline, you know, what would you like to do with that year and why is it meaningful for you? Um, you are, as I mentioned, so for in, in relation to, to the issue about video work, because sometimes I know we have like book artists that you want to show page spreads and you can't do that very easily in these 10 images. Um, so we have this optional PDF that you can upload a PDF that might include more spreads of things like books, or also you might be a poet as well as a photographer, or you might have text that illuminates your work or somehow that's part of it, and you can't upload an image of an essay. I mean, that just doesn't work. So we're, and it's also not the same thing as an artist statement. So we're trying to create another document that you could use if it, if it comes into play into your practice. You don't have to do it, um, but we're trying to give you a, an opportunity for that. So I say, we just don't want to open Pandora's box with a video where we could have 250 videos that everybody wants to use. It just, again, it would create a monster for us. Yeah, question? It's, that's a good question. The question is, this, is this addition? So you do 10 plus the PDF, and no, the PDF actually needs to reference one of those 10 images. And the same thing with the video. I didn't mention that very well. but. Um, with video, again, that video can't just be, oh, because you do multimedia, you're going to have 11 or 12 or 15 projects. Instead, that video, again, has to reference something in 
those 10 images. It can be a still shot from your video, or maybe it's a multimedia thing and, and you have a, a painting that speaks, right? So, I mean, you might have the picture of the painting and then you might have upload um, this sound recording on as a YouTube video, if that makes sense. Any other questions? Those are good questions. Okay. So the selection process, again, these are important dates, and here I'm going to try to explain this three-tiered um, juring process. So um, you hit submit, hopefully on September 14th, not on September 15th, and then what happens? Um, these three jurors asynchronically get to review all of the first round of applications. So we give them two weeks. They have their own personal login and their own personal um, password, and they go in and they look at all of your images, they look at your video, they look at your PDF. If they're interested, they have access to your resume and they have access to your artist statement. And then they rank you one to five, one being the lowest and five being the highest. And they're ranking you on the overall impression of your, of your application, not each work. Like they, they don't say, oh, image number one is a five, image number four is only a two. Like they're giving you just an overall. And they do have a place where they can take notes. Um, in the first round of jurying, um, we don't require them to make comments, but if you, again, make it to the semifinal round, then you do get access to their comments, which is also something I'll talk about a little more thoroughly. So they review all these applications. They score you between one and five. Um, and then what happens is it's a numbers game uh, in the sense that juror like number one might have given you a three, juror number two might have given you a three, and juror number three might have given you a four, which is a 10. And very often a cumulative score of 10 puts you into the semifinal round. But you never know. Um, we very rarely have 15s. I think I've had like two in the eight years I have worked at MCAD. <laughs> two. Just to let you know, I just, you have to understand that you probably know this already, how subjective <laughs> judging art is. And it is very rare that three people are all going to think you're a five. That just doesn't happen. Okay? I usually have a fellow who is selected who got a one from somebody, which is the lowest, and a five from somebody, which is the highest. And the reason for that is that if you get a five from any one person, you're automatically put into the semifinal round. And what happens, again, I just have to explain the serendipitousness of this during process, is that somebody who gave you a five is probably going to champion you. And as I say, this is a consensus building process where over three types of jurying, um, they get the opportunity to talk to one another when they do the conference call. And then if you're selected to be a finalist, then they have that opportunity to meet with you. And as I say, the person who first time may, might have given you a one might just not have seen what that other juror who gave you a five saw in you. And that juror number five may be like, going to go up to bat and say, you know, you have got to see this in person. I just know this is going to be stellar work. And it happens. It happens a lot. So that's why I also never tell people what they score, because it actually means very little. <laughs> so... But at the same time, so um, at the same time, you, that's right. So what, what's important is, is that you apply because you never know that you may find somebody who really, really likes your work. And, um, and sometimes, I mean, it is, it's very hard because there's usually a natural cutoff break. There's, we really only have time in a two to three hour conference call to go over the top 20 to 30. Like one time I had 44 semifinalists and I think my jurors were ready to kill me. I don't know what it was, but it was just those extra, it's just exhausting. And then what happens is they get tired and it's not really very productive. So it's usually this cutoff. Very often it's a 10 or an 11 or above and you get into the semifinal round. And then what we do in this, I give them... Um, a second during interface that has the smaller group, let's say 40, and then they have another two weeks to review those. And this time they are required to look at your resume, they're required to look at your artist statement, and they're required to give comments. And so in their during interface, they have a little comment box where they, they can say anything they want. I try to say, you know, you can think of it as a prep space for their conference call, like taking notes, like, you know, what did you like, dislike about the work? Was there some work that was stronger than others? Like and there they can say, I really liked image number three, but I didn't understand at all what was going on in image number six. You know, they can give comments like that, or they can say in their comments, you know, this artist statement made no sense to me or it didn't support what I saw in the imagery. Um, 
So, and the reason why we're doing that is that we would like to provide anyone who does get into the semifinal round a little bit of feedback. Like sometimes it's more useful than others, but at least you're hearing something from um, the three people who juried you. So what happens is that if you apply and hit submit on September 14th, um, then you will find out on by Friday, October 27th, how far you got in the juring process. Because by that time, the jurors will have already gone through the second round and they will have selected the top 10 to 12 finalists who get studio visits. I wrote down 10, but very often it's 12. They want to see as many as possible. In the two days they're here, it's hard to do more than 12. Um, it is possible, but it's, anyways, we keep it to about 10 to 12. Um, so what we know by October 27th, there's who are the top 10 to 12 who are going to have studio visits. We also know who are the people who made it to the semifinal round and who are the people who didn't make it that far. So you'll get one email if you didn't make it to the semifinal round and you'll get a different email that says you did make it to the semifinal round. Um, because if you're a semifinalist, then you have access to the feedback that the jurors provided, not just in their during interface, but also the conversation that they have. Because then you find out, wow, two of them really wanted to do a studio visit with me, but one of them just couldn't be convinced. And, you know, it's, again, it's not a criticism of you as an artist. It's just the way this juror decided. You know, so much of this is outside of your control, and I want to emphasize that, too. So you'll find out no later than Friday, October 27th, where you stand in the during process. You don't have to wait to the very end. You don't have to wait um, until the finalists have been announced to kind of know where, where you stand. So the jury visits are happening on Saturday, November 11th, and Sunday, November 12th. And I do know that November 11th is actually the same day that the MAEP gallery the Minnesota Artist Exhibition Program is having their annual meeting. So um, we will probably have studio visits in the morning and we'll probably have studio visits in the afternoon. But um, you know, obviously if you wanna be at that annual meeting, we're not gonna make you do your studio visit at that time. So we will respect that. Um, by the end of the day on Sunday, November 12th, the jurors have to decide who are they gonna give the fellowships to. And I call the lucky five people and I send emails to um, the less lucky um, seven or six or whoever the numbers who didn't get it. Um, again, what is a perk is that you do gain, get even more feedback because when the dirt deliberation process, the jurors usually spend again another two to three hours going over all of the finalists and we provide comments for what, you know, reasons why they really want to give this fellowship to you. And then, um, you know, they also articulate maybe they have some concerns like, oh, you know, I didn't really like this thing about that, but we're still going to give you the fellowship, but we just want you to know this. Or they often give suggestions too, like, wow, you should really look into this artist, or maybe you should really think about um, doing this. So again, if you get to the finalist round, and also it's a boon being a finalist because at least two or three times I have had jurors um, call me like six months later and say, I'm doing a show and I really w loved seeing this person's work. And they've been included in shows in different states. Um, another one of my finalists for, I'm not sure if it was for McKnight, yeah, was included in a show in the University of Illinois. So um, you just never know. It doesn't hurt to have your work looked at by people who are outside of the state, so, or in state for that matter. So the announcement. Um, so what happens on November 12th when I, I let the fellows, the five lucky fellows know that they were selected um, and then they have to sign contracts and we have to get PR set up. And so that's why it takes about two weeks for us to get all those things figured out. And we do an official fellowship announcement on November 27th. So, sorry, it's taken me a long time to get there, but it's just kind of like the sieve, you know, you're like this big group and then gets smaller and then gets smaller and smaller. So are there any questions about the process or what you might expect in those different segments? Yeah. I have a question that I should have asked That's okay. The ten, the ten oh, sure. The 10 images. So, um, so should, the t like, should the 10 images have a, those pieces that you choose, should they have a relationship with each other, or should they just be like your best work, or should they? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I mean? so yeah. Just, you know, what kind of relationship should mm -hmm. they have? Yeah, so the question is about those 10 images and what kind of relationship should those images have with each other? Is it better that they are very cohesive and maybe they are all tied together very tightly? Or should they be your best work over a range of time? Or, and that's hard to answer because it really varies from artist to artist. Um, you know, with this particular, because it's an emerging artist, I give different advice when you're applying for the mid-career McKnight. Um, 
it's good to be cohesive to a degree. Like I don't think they want to, they might be really confused. And I want to emphasize that you don't want to create a, like they think it's three different artists and there's just, it's all over the place. But at the same time, I have seen some criticism of applications when it's, it's super tight. Um, and they may just not know where it's going next, right? So I think there's that balance. There's that fine line between, and it's also the idea about like wetting their appetite. Like, wow, I'm going to give you an idea of what I'm doing, but I want you to come and see me in the studio to see more. And again, what that is, I can't, there's nothing definitive. There's nothing objective about that. But um, I, I do encourage you to come up with like different iterations of those 10 images and share them with somebody who knows you well and maybe share them with people who don't know you that well. Like maybe you know a couple artists that you like, would you just look over my application for me? Or you can email me or Melanie and we can look over it for you and give you feedback um, face to face or over the phone or over Skype or something. And I do, we do do this with artists that they come and say, you know, they upload 10 images because it's good to know that you, you have mastered the system and you've uploaded 10 images, but you might then come and visit with me and say, but I have 10 others. Like, what do you think about this? And again, I'm not a juror, but we would talk through like, what are the strengths of it doing this way? And what are the strengths of doing it a different way? Because there's no right answer. It's, it's just going to really depend on your work and, um, and telling yourself that you're creating a particular na visual narrative of yourself and your work in those 10 images because they'll go through it you know in order and like what are what are you how are they building and i think nikki when she's going to go through her application and she's it'll be good to see that so you can she can articulate a little bit about the choices she made and we can analyze a little bit of her choices as i say i i'd encourage you to share if you know somebody else who's also applying you guys share one another's applications and talk about it because I mean, all these jurors are different. So the more sets of eyes look at it, the more you're going to have a sense of all the questions that these jurors may have because you have no idea who they are and what they're going to like, what's going to make sense to them. But you do kind of have to lead them by the nose a little bit. I mean, they're maybe these very smart people. Maybe they look at a lot of art. But, you know, if there's something that you really want them to pick up on, and I'll get to that in a minute, like there is a way in the application for you to kind of try to emphasize and, and direct them a little bit. Because you don't want them meandering off and thinking, I wonder what this is about. Or you, you, know, you can help focus them a little bit. So does that help? Any other questions? Yes. That's a good question. Like yeah, so the question is about like how far back do you go back? Um, and again, I would say, you know, five to 10 years, probably max, only in an extraordinary case, since this is, again, is an emerging artist, early career, only, because again, there might be lots of reasons, like maybe you, you did a project and you dropped it and you picked it up again, maybe four or five years later, and then maybe you want to show that continuity. Um, but you kind of run the risk if you go too far back, because like, what if you were on to something and, you, they, and they're like, wow, but their earlier work was much was better or they think it was stronger. And they're like, I'm just not really interested in what they're doing right now. I mean, because you really because what you're going to have in your studio, you have to think through, like, what if I'm a finalist, too? Even when you're applying for this, you know, you don't know how far you're going to get. But think as you're going to be a finalist. Think about that. And even when you're writing your artist statement, think about what if they're in my studio talking to me for 20 minutes, you know, what I said on this paper, they're going to have a copy of because I give them packets. <laughs> so they have copies of your resume and copies of your artist statement. So, you know, they, they haven't memorized your artist statement, but you need to think that, right? So you're, you may not have, so don't put up a lot of work, too, on your application that you wouldn't be able to show them in the studio. You don't have to have everything, but you should not be doing something way different in your studio today than what you put on your application, or else, again, you might just cause them to you know, lose interest, or they're going to get confused, or whatever. Other questions about? OK. Well, I'll get, I'll get moving. We've already been here an hour. Sorry, I talk a lot. OK, so this is what the jurors on screen interface looks like. And this is just I can go through this quickly, but they have a first round, a second round. This is what they see. And you are just a number to them. And this number is makes has no bearing at all. And when you hit submit, it has no bearing on you get like assigned a number like, oh, you're applicant 4382. That that also number doesn't mean anything. It's not that we had 4000 applicants. Um, but this is kind of what they see. And they get to click on numbers like you may be number um, 174 or something like that. And they click on number 174 and oh, there you are. Okay, so this is what they see. Um, this is a sample from Gregory Euclid. He was a Jerome fellow of, of ours and then became a McKnight fellow. I'm gonna use this for a moment to explain. And again, Nikki can go into her own detail about it. But um, so 
he does work that's, uh, he does sculpture, he does painting, he also does installation-based work. And just to explain that this is, you're able to upload a title. He's a very long title. We don't cut off numbers. So if your title's long, that's okay. Give us your long title. Give us a date. Give us, and he's given us all of the materials. And this is where, too, I'd encourage you, there's not a, a, a limit to how many words or characters you can put into the description. Um, and what it does, I think, is, is to, this is your chance to say more, even about your materials. Like, don't say mixed media installation. If Gregory had done that, I think he might not have gotten the fellowship. Um, because, I mean, it's just this blanket generic thing. And what's interesting about his work is in the details. And, I mean, he gives you this description of stuff that it's like acrylic, acrylic caulk, cast paper. And, again, he writes cast paper from Central Park boulders. And you're like, what? What's that about? Um, Eurocast, a fern, a foam, a hosta. I mean, he has all this. I mean, just the materials themselves kind of sound. It piques your interest. Like, this is what I'm saying. You know, if, don't say I'm a mixed media installation artist. You know, tell me what your materials are made of. And you have a chance to actually just do that in your 10 images. Um, and then you have the scale. One thing is he didn't write down feet or inches. We don't automate. That doesn't load by itself. So you do need to say inches or feet. But in this case, I think they probably figured it wasn't inches. Unless they were looking at this kind of miniature world. And then he, what we do have is we have an opportunity. You have 400 characters right here where you can say something about that image. And this is where I'm saying you can not lead in by the nose and don't interpret the work for them. Um, but this is a place for you to explain what it is they're looking at. And this is something that Gregory did very clearly where he says, you know, I painted a large traditional landscape that flows onto the floor towards a fifth floor window overlooking Central Park. So this is, he was invited to do a show, be a group show at the Museum of Art and Design in New York City. And it overlooks Central Park. If you guys have been there, by, it's by Columbus Circle. Um, the work consists of several dioramas that are built from materials that were collected during walks, as well as paper casts of boulders from Central Park. So he's in this, in this 400 characters, he's able to describe his process as well as kind of the venue. So he's like lots of little gold marks, a lot of gold stars in that little thing. And again, not all of you and not every applicant is going to, and you don't have to even describe every single image, but it helps because I think it makes this more interesting. I mean, it gives a lot of context. And also, this is stuff you won't put in your artist statement. I mean, his artist statement might talk about how he collects his materials by going on walks. But in his artist statement, he's probably not going to go into this kind of detail. So what you put in these little comments section should be different than what goes in an artist statement. I wouldn't just cut and paste from your artist statement saying, oh, they should know this about and this and this and this. I mean, sometimes they, they might converge a little bit. But um, these are kind of different formats. And I, you can convey different types of information. So this is kind of what they see. And down here is where, they, where the jurors have to give you a, a, a mark here. And then this is their little comment box. So it's not very exciting. Um, if, you're, if you do video work and you've uploaded something to YouTube, some people get concerned that they think they have to create some kind of anonymous or what do they do because their name is on their YouTube account. And we create our webmasters, who are wonderful. They um, black out all of that ancillary information. And then again, with video work, um, you're allowed to put a title. Um, the medium, the date, the time, and again, you have a place to explain. Again, this is referencing another image. It says, you know, note the audio clip from closing number three is a sample for the audio installed on the church pew. So he had an image of a church pew and headphones, so he had an installation shot, and then um, this artist also had a video that went with it. So he's referencing um, the photo. To be even more clear, they could say, you know, in image number 10 or something like that. So... Yeah, and real quick, um, selection, I'm going to talk a little bit about what jurors are often looking for, and then I'll give the floor to Nikki. So um, selection criteria. This is um, what we have in it, it, online under the requirements, or it, it lists these four things. It also lists it in a PDF. You can download it from the website, um, mcad.edu slash Jerome. So these are only the four. Like, we don't have a rubric. We don't have a lot of very specific um, qualifications that we're telling our jurors, you need to do this. You know, we're not doing that. It's pretty wide open. This is the only kind of guidance we're giving them, and that is that they are supposed to be selecting um, work based on the quality of the work samples, the submitted materials. So they're, they're saying, what is high quality art? Um, and they're asking themselves, you know, do I see some evidence of serious commitment to artistic practice here? Do I see some accomplishments as well as promise for continued development? So they may say that in the images, or if they're in the second or third round, they're referencing having looked at your resume and having read your artist statement. 
um, the impact the fellowship will have on the artist. Again, that's hard to ascertain just looking at 10 images. That's really something they could only judge further down as they're debating to put you in the finalist round or if you're going to get the fellowship. Um, and again, you really have very little control over how they're going to conceive of that, except for that artist statement where you talk about, you know, what could this money, what could this opportunity, what could that really do for me as an artist? And then we do say that the panel is supposed to consider the breadth of artistic practice in Minnesota, and that includes, includes a wide range of media, aesthetics, traditions, which might be influenced by ethnicity, gender, and geography. So diversity in all of these areas is encouraged, and it varies from group to group what they end up deciding and being making decisions about. Um, again, that's very much out of any one person's control. It becomes this kind of um, consensus building exercise. So that's what they're given. Um, now, this is some of the things they say that they were looking for in the application, and I'm just going to go, and these, again, these are just taken from uh, a, a random sampling of the last, like, three or four years, because before the jurors do their second round of jurying, um, we do have a little icebreaker where we ask them to say, well, so what were you looking for in this work? You know, what, what to you um, really stood out? Um, you know, what does... What does high quality work look like to you? And it's a chance for people to kind of own up to predilections, like say, you know, I really just don't like whimsy, or I hate neon. I mean, you find some weird things like that. Um, but very common, um, you find these are pretty generic ideas. And again, it doesn't really tell you much, except for it means something to that person. <laughs> and we're not quite sure what that means. Um, so like, again, the juror says, well, I was looking to be surprised. And how are you going to know what surprises one person and doesn't surprise another? But they're looking to be surprised. Um, they like work that's conceptually interesting, formally beautiful, um, asking, you know, what conceptual issues is the artist exploring? So the idea about ideas, because there are, um, you know, where you live in the year 2017, what's going on around us, how is your work somehow related to something going on in our, you know, whether it be aesthetics, the idea of conceptually beautiful or formally beautiful, or um, picking up on something that nobody else has picked up on in some way. Um, looking for imagery that's compelling, you know, is it unique, is it something I've seen before, or what makes it different? Um, looking for originality, a strong body of work, um, conceptual ideas, and sometimes, especially the art historian will ask, um, does the artist seem to know history? Do they know where they're coming from, where they're at, and where they're headed? Um, the images have to jump out in a compelling fashion. Um, another juror had said like, the next stage was to see if the work was sitting in any current debates in art. You know, who are they having a conversation with? And this is, you know, again, these are kind of generic comments. Um, looking for attention to detail and attention to the whole. So, I mean, that's kind of an interesting thing, thinking about, you know, does your work, you know, because sometimes the jurors are saying, you know, that level of craftsmanship, does it look well-made if your intent is to make something well-made? I mean, maybe your aesthetic is more, um, you know, a, a mashup of high-low, and maybe, but then um, if that's your conceptual, um, you know, predisposition, then... You know, how is that working for you? And how are you claiming that as your own? If you're an assemblage artist, if you're an abstract artist, if you do installation work, um, and this a question about, you know, what's the ambition? Like, what are you trying to do? What are you working on exploring? And, you know, why are people interested in the work you make? Um, looking for attention to detail. Is there a potential for growth? Some consider, yeah, the idea of considering diversity, different approaches to art practices. You know, are the themes new and fresh? Is it visually compelling? Is a piece going to draw me into a museum or another site? Um, you know, one of the things, too, very much it's a curator who says that, you know, is it going to draw me in? They're very interested in often how the audience is reacting to the image that they're looking at. Um, one thing, because you might have made some amazing piece, but it photographed really poorly. I would leave it out because you need to think about these 10 images as being really eye candy in a way. Because when they're saying they want it to be surprising or interesting or this or that, um, because maybe you made this amazing long scroll that's like 10 inches high and it's 20 feet long. Um, you know, an overall image of that is going to be a very weird image. And, and maybe you do then choose to do a detail, which is fine. Um, you're welcome to do that. You don't have to use 10 images for 10 different pieces. You're maybe one of your pieces you really can only see in up close in detail. So you do one piece and you give me four details. And that may be perfectly, you know, you just need to think about what do you need for those images to really draw in these jurors, to make them, you know, to kind of titillate them, to say, wow, I'd really love to see these surfaces in person, or wow, I love this idea. I, will, I want to talk to this person about what they're doing with it. Um, so that's where 
again, this I know on some levels this is not very helpful because <laughs> uh, it's very vague. But on the other hand, I think you do get ideas about, well, then what? It's up to me, you know? That's why you give it to other people. Like, are you intrigued? You know, do you like this image better than another? Do you understand what's going on in this project? Um, so. so now Nikki, I'll turn this over to you. So these are some examples of her work, and I'll have her kind of thumb through her application. Hi. <laughs> so obviously I'm, I'm a photographer. <laughs> I, I'm, I am a overall visual artist with a focus on photography and um so th these were two of my uh sub 10 submissions my work is really based on um using photography as a catalyst for change and social justice so um this photo on the right <clears throat> I don't know if you remember, but last year a woman named Dana Logan was murdered in, in North Minneapolis on 36th and Russell. Um, she was hit by a stray bullet. Uh, her, her, um, the shooter has not been yet identified. And so my work was and is still to this day um, taking those family members of victims who have been affected by uh, gun violence and giving them a voice without uh, them having to necessarily speak. Um, so that's Dana's husband and her her niece. Um, these these little girls here are um, the children of uh, the two on this the two on the is that my right yeah over there uh, are the siblings of a big brother who was shot. He did not pass, but he was shot, so they've been affected by gun violence. The, the two girls on this side are sisters, and they had an uncle that was taken by gun violence. So they're wearing the shirts uh, that I created, and inside this X, um, the red X, there's many, many names, and those names are only the victims that have been taken by guns um, in a... Uh, shooting, not a suicide or a accidental shooting, but an actual homicide or murder, um, only for the year 2015-2016. So we are now in 2017 and I'm, <laughs> I, I have a, probably about 13 families who have contacted me that want to be photographed um, for the campaign. So, so, so my I applied for this fellowship because, um, not only because I, I, was, I thought I put Bunny in here, did I not? I don't know if I did. What do I do here, Carrie, here? Oh, okay, so I described, am I clicking on it? It's not working. Oh, I see, there it is. So um, obviously, um, it's digital imagery. Um, and so I just put a very brief caption. Um, <clears throat> uh, the campaign is a photo series of artistic photos giving the family members of victims of person-to-person -person gun crimes by the use of unlawful weapons. Um, this image is the digital design. What is happening here? It's hard to read, but, but I, didn't, I, I don't see where that image was showing. It's, it's talking about my logo right there. Yeah. Okay, but anyway. So, yeah. So that's talking about the logo. I thought I was going to talk about the pictures that you just saw. So um, that explains the logo, obviously. Um, and here is, Carrie, help me, please, because I do not know what I'm doing here. Sorry. Like, I'm just yeah. clicking Can away. Just, yeah, you can go back here, too. So I've, it, oh, so, so, so how do I? I went in order in image two, three, four, five. Okay, so that one. Yeah, these are just screenshots from your actual application. <gasps> so here you mentioned. Can I click on that or no? No, I didn't do all of those. Okay, so, so so one of the images I I put in was um, Bunny Beeks's daughter, who Bunny is the daughter of Burdell Beeks, who was the 58 year old grandmother murdered on Penn Avenue. In, in May, and so her daughter, which is pictured in the in the front top image there, is holding a sign that says someone knows something. At this time, um, it was very shortly after this crime took place, 
and I photographed Bunny and I photographed her daughter and and this is the image that I submitted. Um, I did submit the one of Bunny too, I just don't know where it is. Um, so it just explains that the same thing, um, the Enough Campaign is a photo series of artistic photos giving the family members of victims of person-to-person -person gun crimes by the use of unlawful weapons. This photo is Burdell Beek's granddaughter who was in the back seat of the minivan when Burdell was shot in gang crossfire. So that, that um, and then I already explained the one of the little girls. So <clears throat> I also went around to the community and I got people in the community that um, have been doing some work like this for a long time. So that's um, Elder Mahmoud Al-Khati and he, he allowed me to photograph him and then use him for my campaign to kind of just get some of the elders in the community involved. Same with the other photo down there. And I explained that um, in my caption as to why I use them um, and who they were. Um, this upper young lady with the hair, um, she was a part of a series that I did when uh, Philando Castillo was shot. Uh, and I and I did a bunch of kids, young people, children, family members of um, men holding signs, just saying that could have been my dad or that that was my dad or don't shoot my uncle, whatever the cases were. There, so so each of these are a part of a different series, and um, and so I, I have to say this uh, when I got this fellowship. <laughs> I was like, ooh, I'm gonna do this one, and I'm gonna do that one, and I'm gonna do this, and I have done that, and now I'm all confused because I don't know what to pick. <laughs> um, again, more more um, people in the community. This this was really about me uh, wanting to perfect and and do better at what I do. And at this time, I was using a camera that that was n not great but I was, I was making up for it in editing and things like that. So the fellowship allowed me to get the camera that I needed to be able to produce um, really amazing work. Um, these are family members of other people that have been, uh, this, the guy in the back is the, the uncle of Levante King who was the two year old murdered on Lowry and Penn. Uh, this is Jimmy Stanbeck's mother, uh, Burdell's, uh, Bunny's son, Burdell's grandson, um, community member here, and then again, Bunny's daughter. And I believe I explain, I do explain that. So I didn't explain like the guy that you showed the, the, with like, that was awesome, by the way, that flowing onto the ground thing. Um, I didn't explain, um, in depth of the actual people. I, I, I more so explained the campaign and how the people were related to it because I felt like I wanted whoever was gonna read that and see that to know why I'm choosing to take these pictures. Um, oh, that, that's, am I done? Oh. Do you wanna talk a little bit about the studio visit? Yeah, and then so the studio visit after after I actually got the call and I was and I was told that I would have a studio visit, um, I took my little camera and I and I went and I prepared some images to go along with uh, the the original images that I submitted um, that I felt were going to give even more um, feeling and movement to the jurors when they came. So I, I had them, I, I used a space where I work and, and I lined everything up for, for them to see and I also created a, a video that kind of was, I call it a public service announcement around um, public safety and gun violence, but it was really, it really was a thing for the families to use for themselves through my art to share when they're talking about their the loss of their family members, so it's it's used for me and it's used for for them, um, and it was it was it was really cool to to meet the people that came and to be it, like I was freaking out nervous, but it was 
<laughs> but, it, but it was cool because because I'm I'm not like a stuffy suity person, and so it was it was once they got in and at, you know they asked a lot of questions. They're gonna ask you questions, and so have your stuff together when they come because <laughs> cause they are gonna ask you some questions, and and, and if you don't have answers you, you should have answers so i don't know what else to say i'm just any anybody have questions for me yeah yep so for i i talked specifically about the project um because it it really like like she was asking earlier it's a, it goes together um and i and i talked i have had i have had some recognition prior to the um to getting the fellowship it, i was like right on the verge of getting some other um recognition so it i was really in a place where um i was emerging like it was it was exactly that place for me to be so i focused only on this project, but the fellowship has allowed me to expand it into mini, little mini series um, that I'll be doing at the at the actual exhibition. Anything else? Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you are too. Yeah, but since 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 Nikki's you know a photographer, then the issue of high quality. My next thing is talking about high quality images, and with photographers, it's maybe obvious that this is a very clear image. It's very clean. It shares a lot. It's, I mean, it it actually tells a lot, but it also asks a lot of questions at the same time. It's, I mean, they're very intriguing images. Um, I think that's one of the many reasons why she was selected. But I think what artists need to know is if you're not a photographer, it might behoove you to get to know a photographer. <laughs> um, because it does really make a difference. There are works that I know, I've seen in person that just don't look that good in images. And this is all you kind of have. I mean, these are the limits of the, of the application. And you have to also approach anything you apply for. It's like, you know, where, how can I do the best job given the deficiencies I mean, because in an ideal world, you all would get a studio visit because it work looks so different in, in the flesh, and um, that would be great if we could offer that, but it just is an impossibility. So, you know, given that we have to work with digital images and you have 10 images, and this is the, the title, the date, the media, the comments, you know, what can you do to kind of convey as much as you possibly can within the limitations of this particular format? So I just want to go through some examples of previous work. And this is a reason to just also highlight the range of work that I feel like gets selected by our jurors over the years. But just to say again, like it, people often have questions about, you know, do I do an overall shot? Do I do a detail? And this is to kind of give you a little bit of a variety of, of, of what I've seen. So this is a far an installation shot. Very often if you, this was a, an artist, um, uh, Richard Barlow, again, who, he applied many, many years. <laughs> People very often apply years and years and years and sometimes they get lucky. Um, but this was a great year for him because he had this opportunity to do these large scale installations. And so he include, these are chalk drawings that he did um, at, at McAllister College. And it just so happened too that these were still on view when the jurors came. So he was actually able to take them in person and show them these. So again, sometimes this is all serendipitous and it's kind of outside your control. It was, yeah, because McAllister College was closed at the time. They were doing their renovation. Wow, yeah. So it was for one year they had, um, their gallery was in a small house that was on campus that was not their regular space. No, 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 it's not the old space. No, no, but this is, it was at McAllister, but during the interim period when they were getting their new fine arts center. So, so again, a totally random, and he had the chance to actually draw on the walls like this and had this kind of really interesting old, like, 1940s house that he, he was able to install in, so... Um, this is the work of Gregory Euclid. We saw the other previous image. This is other examples of his work. Um, this one's very different in the sense that he did, I mean, it just kind of looks like it's floating in space and you don't really get a sense of scale or anything. So that's why I think it was important for Gregory to give some installation images, because otherwise, although you get to, you have little numbers that the jurors are looking at, it's really still hard for them in a heartbeat to really get that sense of scale. And so, um, you know, if it makes sense, it might make sense for you to in include an installation image. 
Um, this is an example of Lauren Herzak Bowman's. She's now moved to Cleveland, but she's a ceramicist. And this was, um, again, a photo of her um, porcelain work. And again, because it's on the floor, you get that sense of scale, too. This is the work of Michael Hoyt. Um, and he was a Jerome Fellow through the Artists on the Verge, which is uh, also a Jerome-funded project through Northern Lights MN. And this was his final installation for that. And again, this may not be the best photograph, but what it does too is he, it was a multiva multivalent kind of project that worked on a lot of different levels. And um, down here was this topographic map that it was a physical space that you could click on. There was a computer here that you would click on and then it would take you to, he made paintings of different events that were being circulated um, through an online group chat so there are things that happen in his neighborhood like there was like there's a chicken on the loose or there was a shooting i mean sometimes it's very perilous and other times it's kind of fluff stuff i don't know if you guys belong to any of those neighborhood chat groups but anyways it was based on actual events that people were describing on these chat groups and then he made it it was about his neighborhood so anyways it's again it, it was enough so sometimes images in and of themselves may not be like something you want to frame and hang on a wall, but they have to be enough to convey some information about what it is you're doing. And that's hard sometimes. Um, this is the work of Amanda Hankerson, photograph, photographer, the work of Melissa Loop, uh, the work of Lauren Roche. She is a totally self-taught artist. She's not had any art instruction. She makes these amazing little portraits with linseed oil. <laughs> They're very shiny. Um, this is the work of Pa Her, photographer. The work of Nate Young. And again, some people have questions, you know, well, in this piece, the framing is part of the piece. Like sometimes people choose frame to include frames in their work and sometimes not. And again, it really depends on the nature of the piece. Um, if you just frame something just because you need a way to hang it on the wall, you probably don't need to include that in your images. But um, in this case, he's kind of creating these little cubicles and they almost feel like little prayer books and they are referencing and they look like they could be something hung in a church and they also match the pews that he had in, in this installation and then again what I'm showing you here is a is a video still like so again you can't just have a video and not reference it in your 10 images so this is an example of of what he did for for that these are some more recent fellows Miranda Brandon the photographer on the left Sing Lee an installation that he um, he did uh, the work of Star Wallowing Bull on the left, a painter. Uh, the work of Sam Weinberg on the right. And uh, the work of Emmett Ramstead on the left. And the work of Lindsay Reiner on the right. And Lindsay, too, is a self-taught artist. Um, I'm also going to do a plug for our Jerome Fellowships and what we offer artists because Emmett Am Ramstead just was written up in Hyperallergic today, this morning, in fact. Um, the, uh, as I mentioned, we're allowed to bring in one national critic and we brought in a curator by the name of Risa Pulio, and um, she um, liked his work quite a bit and uh, wrote an article that, uh, and interviewed him, and that interview got published on this national, international website. So, that's great. <laughs> I think it's fabulous. So, I mean, that's what, it doesn't happen every day, but you know, it's nice that um, the fact that we were able to pay for her to come in and meet Emmett, and, and she's come back a couple times now to the Twin Cities, which is also one of the things that we like to do, because very often we bring people here who actually haven't been here or haven't been here in a long time, and um, they get interested in what's going on here. So it's not always just about the fellows, it's really about a larger community, so. Okay, and now these are images, I'm gonna show you a poor image quality. Um, these are not real images that were submitted, these are things that were found randomly on the web, <laughs> so. So this is um, not a great installation shot, so um, do not feel obliged to put in an install shot if it's not gonna do justice to your work. So, um, and this is an example of something that um, in the very, you know, you don't want work that's um, not cropped well, that has hot spots. You know, it really might behoove you to pay somebody <laughs> if you don't know how to take good photos yourself, so. Anyways, that's just my, my plug for good images because it really, they do matter quite a bit. The order might matter quite a bit. And so I would encourage you to you know, ask questions of your friends, of colleagues, or call Melanie or myself, and we're happy to give feedback. 
So this is the end of the um, kind of nuts and bolts of how do you apply kind of some insights into maybe approaches. Now the rest, I'm happy to stay and give um, more individual, like one-on-one -on -one descriptions of like how to apply. Like I'll go through the actual application, like hitting when you hit what and what you need to upload. That's what the rest of the next half hour will be. So if you don't need that, if you've applied for Jerome before or you feel comfortable, you know, you, again, you can leave at any time. Um, I'm just gonna go step by step kind of through the application process, so. Thank you for coming. And before you leave too, I do have samples of previous catalogs from the last four years. You're welcome to take one if you, if you want one or if you don't feel obliged, but you're welcome to. And also there's more postcards if you wanna give them to friends. Yeah, they're down here. They're, the catalogs are on the table in the lower um, right. And also online, we do have um, an archive of all of our previous McKnight shows since 2009. And on those, you can download a PDF of those catalogs as well, if you're interested. So, great. Well, I'm going to start just kind of going through this. I don't want to take up more, too much more of your time. But this is what you see if you go to... Um, uh, we now have a, like a little apply um, on our web page, that landing page for our Jerome Fellowships. At the top it says apply, and if you click on that, it'll take you to this page. And also at the top um, we mentioned that the application is now open, and if you click on the words now open, it also takes you to this online application site. And this is just going to be your welcome page that tells you when the deadline is, and actually the recording of this, of tonight's presentation will also be uploaded to this particular landing page for the application. So um, if you want to come back to this, um, that will be available in about a week. So. so the first thing you have to do is create an account. And even if you've applied for a Mc McKnight I mean, or Jerome before, you actually need to start from scratch. We don't keep your logins, we don't keep your usernames from the years previous. You, every year you apply, you need to create a new account. Um, and we also have made this, because it seems that sometimes your computer might have, it memorizes things, like if you ask it to save passwords and things like that, it might already have remembered some of those things. So one of the things you have to do, we have this little red notice that says, make sure that it is, there's no pre-populated data including spaces in any of the form fields. Because sometimes what you might do is you like click on, you're gonna like type in your name and you might pre-populate it with something. Don't do that, just clear it out and retype it in. Don't cut and paste from other things because what happens is it may be putting in words or things that you don't want there. So just to try to explain that. Um, so you're just gonna create an account and then you hit submit and you hit your password here and do it twice. Hopefully it's a password you can remember. Um, then it tells you that you can go to the online application to begin. And it does remind you here that you're welcome to come back to this at any time. Like it saves things as you are doing it. So you could go in tonight and start on something. You could come and upload an image uh, two weeks from now. You could go in and upload your resume. So you can do it however long, take as long as you want to do it. So. This is the entry form where we're asking your name, city, street, phone, and all this information so we can get a hold of you. Um, we also f are collecting information um, for data for the Jerome Foundation about ethnicity and gender, how many times you've applied, your date of birth, we're getting a range of that. That's not stuff that's shared with our jurors, it's stuff that the Jerome Foundation asks us to collect. So. Um, here is what it looks like if you click on, and up here you, what you do is create accounts the first step, the entry form is the second, and you can always go up here to, um, to click on images. And what happens is you upload one image and then it, after you upload one, it automatically repopulates it so it's ready for image number two. So um, here, which is, you see where your title, name, date of creation, um, dimensions, and then here's where you can add whatever kind of information you want. And this is where you upload your image and then you hit upload. And this is an example of what it might look like. And this is you know, nonsense in here. But do, and, and we actually have upped it to, this says 300 characters, but actually this year we've upload, up, upped it to 400 characters. So you have a little bit more room to kind of give some information. Uh, if you have a problem, it'll let you know that. And what it says is there's an image size error. And this is telling us that your image that you tried to upload wasn't exactly 1920 pixels in the largest dimension. So um, it keeps this information that you might have typed in, 
but it doesn't keep the image. One thing about this is if it won't, re it won't give you, you can't go on to uploading image number two. Um, you could upload all your images and not fill in the title, medium, date, and that kind of stuff. So you could upload 10 images and not fill that stuff in, and that's fine. Um, you can come back and add that stuff later. And I'll show you in a minute that you can also delete things and move things around. Like maybe you uploaded image number one, but you're like, you know what? No, that'd be better as number image number eight. At the very end, you can do that. You can move these images up and down. You don't have to delete it and re-upload an image just to move the location. So what do you need to do if, if you get that notice that it's not 1920 in the largest dimension? Now, this is based on um, Photoshop. Hopefully, that's a very p common editing program. There are others out there. Um, but generally what you're needing to do is change the image size. And I'm quickly just going to show you kind of what you need to do in order to change the image size, because that's what that error message means. Um, and you click on image size, this kind of um, window pops up, and it tells you here, oh my gosh, yeah, something needs to be 1920, and look, my largest dimension right now is 3886. That's, that's no good. So what you need to do is resample the image. So you click this here, and what you're going to go here is... Um, here it's in inches, but we can change it to pixels. And you also want to change the resolution to 72. Like if it was 300 or 200, you can just knock it down to 72. That's a, the basic standard kind of web um, uh, resolution. So we've, un we've, undone, we've unclicked resample image, and this is kind of where we're at. We hit OK. Then we go here. We're going to change this. Actually, we're going to go up here, excuse me, to the width here, and type in 1920. And because it down here you've constrained, if that's clicked constrained proportions, then whatever happens here, it's automatically going to adjust the smaller dimension. Okay, and then what you need to do too, once you've done that, you need to save. You need to save for web and devices. Or here, it, it, it varies like where you can do this. You save it as a small file. Sometimes it's under the Save As, and other times it's under the, the Export. And it varies from which version of Photoshop you have um, where you're able to do that. But the idea of saving for web is it means that they're making it not a ginormous file. And that's important because, again, our system, your, the size of the file that you're uploading needs to be 1.9 um, megabytes, megabytes or less. So if it's two, it's going to say, oh, there was an error. It's too big. And as I say, 1920 is, is a big enough image. Um, if the jurors have a big display, like we don't know what kind of display they're going to be using. They might use a laptop. They may have like a 40-inch amazing computer display. Um, but the, what 1920, in its longest I mentioned, ends up being is up to 26 inches, which is a pretty good sized image if they have a display that that's big enough. So you really don't don't worry about the 1920 because if it's going to be a good image, but you do need to make sure it's not at 300 DPI and that you save for web and devices. So this is where, and as I say, different programs, it's in different places, but you want it to be a small enough image. And then um, when you do it for the save for the web, you often get this kind of weird looking thing. You're like, oh my gosh, I can't see the whole thing, but that's just the window vision. That's just what you see. What you do need to look at here is you want to make sure you're saving it as a JPEG. Don't save it as a TIFF. Don't save it as anything else. Um, you want to make sure the quality here generally needs to be 60 to 80. It doesn't need to be 90 or 100. So that's another way of making the image small enough so it can be uploaded. Um, and then here we see already this, is, this looks good. We want it to be click here, this convert to RGB. And you can save. Oh, here we upped the, the quality. If you want to up the quality, you can do it here. You know, 60, 70, 80 is fine. And you save it as whatever you want it to be saved as title-wise. Again, we're not seeing your titles. We're just seeing your images. So whatever is easy to organize, like maybe it's Jerome Image 1 or something like that. You just give it whatever title. Or you maybe you want to know, remind yourself of the title. Um, and you just save that. And if it's uploaded correctly, this is what you see. It says your data has been uploaded, and you'll see the title, medium date, the dimensions. In this, in this example, we didn't have any additional information. And if you upload a second image, this is what it, they just, it builds right underneath itself. And here's these, these edit and delete buttons. As I mentioned, if you want to edit something like, oh my gosh, I put down the wrong date. And you don't actually have to put down the exact date, although Nikki did for her photos because that was kind of a way she catalogs them. But you can just write the year. 
you know, unless your date is very specific to your project. Um, you don't even need the month. You can just, the date is just generally the year that you created the object. And again, here in this example, we didn't put inches or feet, but I would encourage you to do that. I guess I, they'd probably assume it's not 36 feet, <laughs> but you just don't know. You might as well be explicit. So, and this is a detail. And here I'm saying, again, um, you, you might really want to do that for your work if it's textures matter or if you're, you just need to, to hone in on something feel free to use details. It's not necessarily a wasted image. It may be really what the jurors need in order to understand your work or get more excited about it. So um, you upload the same kind of information for your videos if you choose to do videos. And again, you're not penalized one way or the other. It's just an option. Um, now with this additional PDF, again, you're just basically uploading a file. And it tells you that your file has been uploaded successfully. Your resume, the same thing. And we remind you here, you're not supposed to put your name, your address, phone number, or email address, or things like that on your resume. We want it just to be your information, because we don't, um, this is a blind process in the, the first round and second round, where they don't um, know who you are. They're not given any biographical information about you, except for what you put in your artist statement. And um, we don't want them to like be swayed by, oh, you, you now because your name is on your resume, they're gonna assume you're male or assume you're female or make jump to conclusions or think that you're one thing or another or they get excited and wanna to go to your website. And we just don't want them to get like, I have this extraneous information. We want them to focus on the things that we're giving them to focus on, so. And if you do accidentally upload your name and your stuff on your resume, that's another reason why we check things. And um, we actually often go in and we just, we can delete out your name and re-upload re it ourselves as we are evaluating it. But as I say, if you accidentally upload two resumes or two artist statements, then we'll call you and ask you to send us the right document. Um, it tells you again if things are uploaded, if everything looks good. The artist statement, same thing. We also mention here, um, we ask that you indicate what you'll be working on in the upcoming year. Don't include your name, address, phone number, email address in your artist statement. It tells you if it's been uploaded. And you can review it too. Like once you've uploaded it, you can download it again. You just click download and it'll go to your downloads folder. And if you delete it, like, oh my gosh, I did the wrong version. <gasps> just delete it and then upload a different one. So you've got lots of options. Oh my gosh, so this is our confirm eligibility. So I went through that whole long list <laughs> about all of the eligibility requirements. Um, and we've kind of cut and pasted and put that in the application because we want you to review them again um, I guess I mean, what we most are concerned about is that you have been a, um, you know, a Minnesota artist for at least one year, because that's important that um, you fit that qualification. And as I say, if we have any questions, we'll call you and talk to you about it. But this is just to reiterate that it does, um, we're, we're taking your word for it, that you are who you say you are, and you are the person who's done these things on your resume. Um, you know, I don't go and look up to see on every single resume. <laughs> Did you really get your education here? Did you really do a show at SUVAC in 2011? You know, there's no time for us to do that. So I mean, we're, we're just trying to stress it. We want you to be who you say you are. <laughs> and you do have to click that, yes, I've read these eligibility requirements and I am who I say I am. And we do have this information that you are allowed to apply as a collaboration. Like, so maybe there's three of you who've been working for three years and you've made a lot of work and you go use the word tomato is your group name. And you're welcome to apply. You just, your resume, you're gonna have artist A, B, and C. Um, the work you do upload should be all made by all three of you though. It shouldn't be like, I'm gonna do two pieces by this person and two pieces by another. Um, you know, we don't have a lot of collaboratives, but in 2009-10 we did, um, Tynan Kerr and Andy Maserol, um applied as a collaborative and got it. So um, it's not unheard of. And writing and con confirmation. Um, this is where we ask you to click this. I meet the eligibility requirements. I accept that. Um, and it tells you if you haven't completed, like if you try to hit the submit button or the complete button up here, um, and if you haven't uploaded all your images, it's going to tell you that. And and if you haven't confirmed your eligibility requirements, it'll tell you that. So the system knows, but the system, as I say, doesn't know the difference between a resume and an artist statement. So that's where that's where we sometimes have confusion. And this year we've added something new as well because we have a lot, a lot of artists who say, gosh, I just hit submit, but I forgot what I uploaded. <laughs> and that happens. And in the past, we've done like screenshots of people's application and sent it to them as a PDF. But now you, before you hit submit, you can download it. 
you can just click here, you can download your submission and it gets exported to you. And so you'll have all your images um, and your statements and things like that. So um, now you can archive it if need be. And when you do hit submit, um, you're, is again, you're not, then you kind of lose the ability to log in and make further changes. So, and it will send, once you hit submit, it'll tell you the date and time it was completed and that kind of information. And you're welcome to print that for your records. And if you have questions, you can also call us and say, gosh, I just submitted this. I just want to double check. And for us and our, during, we have a, a back door to your application. And when you hit submit, um, it goes from one color to a different color. So it's very obvious to us if you've hit the submit button. So, so that's kind of a very brief overview of those eight steps to applying. Are there any questions about any of those steps in particular? Sure. Okay. Yeah, that's a good question. So the question is about what if you sign your art? How is that anonymous? And we are not, we don't, we don't ask you to delete your name out of your artwork. That's, again, that's part of the artwork itself. You know, it's embedded in it. That's fine. You know, that's, and um, I mean, people make self-portraits. We're not going to ask you, like, what if, we're not going to ask you to not do your own self-portrait if that's what you do as an artist. It's more that we just want to minimize the areas where it could be a distraction. And the same goes for your resume. I mean, some artists, they go through and delete their names if their names have been inside in articles or in exhibitions. But again, if, if it appears every once in a while, it's, again, it's not the end of the world. You, you can if you wish, but if it's too onerous, um, again, we're not going to disqualify you for that reason. We, I mean, again, we can only make it anonymous to a point. Because <laughs> your, your, your again, your, your signature might be there. And some people might do videos where your, inter your, your video work is you interviewing somebody as a talk show host. You know, we're not going to ask you to make different work just to make yourself invisible, if that makes sense. No, you, could use you can use in publicity, but you could just usually... the. Yeah, it usually has a title, like it'll say, you know, so-and-so, and you can just either use ellipses or just use the second part of it, or just say that it was an exhibition review and say the newspaper and say who wrote it. And you don't really need that, your name, to make it, I mean, you can just excise it. As I say, we're not going to go through every resume and take that out for you, because that, again, for some people, that just, it, Again, at that point, too, it, we just don't want it to be like the first information, too, that people see. Because, again, we, we don't want them to be making snap judgments and get like, oh, I'm going to go to their website and look them up. They still could if they see your signature and they really want to, but we just want to not make it their priority. So, Are there other questions about any part of the application process? Well, you guys have been very attentive. <laughs> it's been two hours, and I appreciate your questions. and. I hope you will apply and do call us if you have, email us, because we're, we're here to be a resource. And I need to get back to the, the one artist who had the question about applying if they're not a, a US citizen. So I have my own homework to do tonight. So, but thank you for coming and I hope um, to see you in future application rounds. Thanks for coming.